Greetings, sweet friends in Christ. Spring is arriving, right? It is beautiful. Now, I know the official arrival of spring is Tuesday, which is also my birthday, but it is already here, isn't it? We see the trees budding, the flowers blooming, the birds are chirping. Oh my gosh, when I'm sitting in my uh, breakfast room in the morning, I almost can't think about anything else for hearing those beautiful birds chirping. Isn't it just wonderful? Of course, I prefer when they're outside, right, Shelly? Yes. <laughs> Shelly was, she just came in and she said a bird got into her house this morning. Did y'all get it out? I, I didn't get a chance to ask. Praise be to God for our hero, Isaac. <laughs> so the bird is, is back outside where he belongs. Uh, but, oh, joy. Sometimes spring comes indoors uninvited, but uh, usually it's, it's a beautiful thing. But spring is a time of new birth. The seeds that we gave our children this morning are a reminder of the new birth. And so is Lent a time of new birth. It is a time for us to open our hearts to God's amazing grace and eternal love. Today we continue with Jesus on his journey to the cross, a journey that gives us new life in Christ. In our passage this morning, we have the opening of what is known as our Savior's final discourse, his final words to us before his crucifixion and resurrection. We will hear from John 12, 20 through 31. But first, let us pray. Dear God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear and a heart to respond to your word spoken into our lives today. Amen. And now let us hear from God in John 20, and I'll be reading John 12, and I'll be reading verses 20 through 31. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And the crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We are all here this morning because we are seeking a word from God. We are seeking Jesus. It may come in an actual word. We may see him in a song or a movement or an action or a prayer. We want to feel the presence of the living Christ. So perhaps we can identify with the Greeks in our passage this morning who walk up to Peter and say, we want to see Jesus. I want to 
don't want to gloss over that either. I want us to think about the significance of that in our passage this morning, the importance of what is happening here. Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem. Now we're going to have more on that next Sunday when we when we celebrate Palm Sunday, we'll celebrate his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But it is not only the insiders who gather to see Jesus. It is not simply the Jews who gathered to see Jesus. Scripture says the Greeks are gathering around Jesus. Already we see the gospel message going to the whole world. We all want to see Jesus. Jesus wants everyone to see him. And so Jesus answered, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. We don't have to wonder what that passage means because Jesus tells us, he says, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies... It bears much fruit. A parable of seeds and death and life. Now, we handed out some seeds this morning to the kiddos. I plan to sprinkle my seeds back in the back 40 of my yard that doesn't get mowed, and maybe something beautiful will come up. I don't know. But these seeds are tiny. And when I look at them, it's a little bit deceiving. They appear dead. But looks can be deceiving. Inside each of these little seeds is a life waiting to spring forth. They come alive when the conditions are right. And we talked about that a little, when they're planted into fertile soil, when there is enough water to nourish them. And then as they sprout, as the sun helps them grow. When it is planted in the soil, only then can it come to life. Now those who worked the land in Jesus' day, they understood this parable. They understood what Jesus was talking about. And they realized then that Jesus must die before he can come alive again. Before he can bear fruit. So the cross is not the end. It is the beginning. After Jesus is placed in the tomb, it is only after he dies that he can come back to life. And it is through his death and resurrection that his message of love and mercy and grace bear fruit. And in case we thought this kind of selfless love was only for Jesus, it is not. If we want to see Jesus, if we want to live for Jesus, we too must die to self and live as Christ. If we live for ourselves, Scripture says, we will lose our lives. If we live for something bigger than ourselves, if we live for Christ, we will bear fruit. We will have eternal life, both in this world and the world to come. So church, here is today's gospel message in a nutshell, or perhaps I should say in a seed. To live for Jesus, we must die to self. Now how many of you have family that you would give anything for. I know I'd give anything for my children. I'd do anything for my children, right? I I sacrifice myself more times than I can count in order to do what is best for my children. I've seen loving aunts do the same, loving friends do the same. This is what a self-giving love looks like. Christ died because he truly believed that the way to real life, eternal life, is to live for others. He died to show us that when our lives seem out of control, hey, does anybody's life seem out of control? Can I get an amen? When your life seems out of control, there is one who knows. 
who understands what we're going through. Jesus prayed in this prayer, Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But then he realizes, no, it is for this hour that I have come. There will be suffering. There is one who draws us to himself and shows us how to live and how to bear fruit. Christ calls us out of selfishness, of thinking only of ourselves, into radical hospitality, doing things that sometimes make us afraid. In the name of Christ. Christ died to show us how to live by loving passionately, by caring deeply, by giving our love and our resources to others, by giving ourselves to serve the poor, the oppressed, the persecuted, those in prison, those in hospitals, to serve those who need to feel the love of Christ. This is a, a call to discipleship, a call to living for Christ, a call to be a follower of Christ. And once again, we don't have to wonder what Jesus means. He tells us in verse 26, he says, Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Whoever serves Jesus must follow him. And wherever Christ is, there we will be also. So, friends, where is Christ? Can you spot him? Christ is everywhere, truly everywhere. In the United Methodist Church, we call this God's prevenient grace, God's grace that goes before us. Even before we are there, God is already there. Jesus is everywhere. So church, we are called to serve Jesus wherever he is, and Jesus is everywhere. Christ is there with us when we suffer and when we celebrate. Emma Kate, you had a birthday this week, right? Linda, you got a big one tomorrow, right? Who else had birthdays in March? Look at all of you. Yeah, there you go. We got some birthdays going on. I mean, you guys are with us in the celebration. I, I hope you celebrate those wonderful moments and don't take them for granted. And God is with you in that celebration. God is also with us in our trials. And when we walk beside someone in their suffering and in their joy, we embody the very presence of Christ. This past weekend, our family gathered, my son and my daughter and their families. We all got together at the beach, and we stayed in a condo big enough to house us all. I haven't had my children all under one roof in far too long. It was a beautiful thing. And I want to thank Jeannie for covering for me for last Sunday and also taking care of any pastoral concerns. I appreciate that very much. But we scattered Kim's ashes. It was a tearful time. And I want to share with you this morning just a little bit of what I said when we scattered those ashes, and then I'll tell you why I'm sharing it. I spoke this painful truth. There will never be a day we don't miss him. Never a day we don't wish we could hear his voice or ask him for advice just one more time, or hug him, or tell him how much we love him. There are things we don't want to happen, but have to accept. Things we don't want to know, but have to learn. And people we can't live without, but have to let go. And so we go on, and we make him proud. And we remember to look for the little bits of him that live on in us. That's just a part of what I shared. But as I drove home that five-hour drive, I had time to think and reflect on those words. And I had my sermon also. I had already, you know, started work on my sermon. And I saw how those words matched 
God's message for us today. We all want to see Jesus. We all want to hear his voice every day. We all want to ask him for advice. We want to tell him how much we love him. And even though there are things that happen in our lives that we don't understand, like the loss of our beloved, the loss of a dear child, or cancer, or wars and rumors of wars, we go on. And we make Jesus proud. And we remember to look for the ways that Christ lives in each of us. Christ died to teach us not to be afraid. As one scholar puts it, Christ died to teach us that there is a force more powerful than death. Namely, the love of God. And because of that, because of God's love, there is always life right in the middle of death. Nowhere is that seen more clearly than on the cross. Jesus confirms this in his final words in today's passage. And he says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. When Jesus is crucified on the cross, when he rises from the dead three days later, that is when all the world sees what love looks like. No greater love has a man than would lay down his life for a friend. Also from John's Gospel. This is what love looks like. Self-sacrificial Love. Love that thinks of others before self. So, to ch so church, to live for Jesus, we must die to self. We must die to self to be born again. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Think of the seed when planted in fertile soil, when given enough moisture and light, it grows and it bears fruit. May it be so in our lives today. Amen.